It's the Rugby Pass Fan Zone Lions Edition, live from London, with Scotland's Jim Hamilton, England's Andy Goo, oh. Ireland and Lions' Stephen Ferris. and Lions, Jamie Roberts, and you, the fans. Well, we did have a predictable cheer there for Jamie Roberts because we are at a Welsh rugby club, not any Welsh rugby club. We're at London Welsh rugby club, ladies and gentlemen. This is... Yay! And this is Rugby Pass Fan Zone Live, Lions Edition. Yeah. But we are actually live this time. I say we've been live over the last 18 months, but we've not really been live. But we are live today, but we are also, also virtually live as well. So fantastic to be here with Rugby Pass Fan Zone Live. It's been a long time in the making. Today is not all about Jamie Roberts, the Lions, Andy Goo, Stephen Ferris and myself. It's about you guys as well. It's about you guys at home. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Being here... At London Welsh, a we yes, a Welsh rugby club. What is a Welsh rugby club without a good old sing song? Cue the song. I saw the light on the night that I passed by the window. I saw the swing of the shining shadow on the blind. Oh, we're on. We're done. Slightly out of sync. Good old Australian song. Um, that's how it sounded back then anyway. No, well done to the singers out there. Obviously, we're out of time because it's been a long time in the making. We've not been out of the house in a while, have we, uh, gentlemen and ladies in the building tonight? But look, it is Rugby Pass Fan Zone. It is about the fans. It's about the fans in here. But it is also about the fans at home virtually. And I'm going to point you to my famous Grouse Spirit of Rugby Wonderwall. Can you give us a wave? Can you hear us there? Are you there? Can you hear us? Can you see us? They can, slightly delayed. This is how we've been living our lives, ladies and gentlemen, as we know over the last 18 months, so we'll keep everyone entertained on this. And it isn't just about us gentlemen up here, the guys on screen, the famous grouse. We've got a lovely young lady, Laura Jane, in the crowd. LJ, how are we doing out there? Are you as hot out there as we are in here? Probably more so than any other club, London Welsh is synonymous with the British and Irish Lions. From 1904 through the early part of the last century, they supplied a handful of Lions, but it was the Welsh Wizards of the 1970s who really married this club with the most famous touring team in the world. To this day, this club still holds the record for supplying the most Lions from one club on a single tour. The Magnificent Seven of John Taylor, John Dawes, Gerald and Mervyn Davis, Mike Roberts, Jeff Evans and JPR Williams all played club rugby right here and then travelled to New Zealand for a 26 match tour in 1971. The Lions beat New Zealand 2-0 in a four test series, the only Lions team to ever win a series in the land of the long white cloud. And whilst it may be some time since they provided Alliance tourists, I'm told that Alliance Heart still beats strong at this club. So it's the perfect place for us to kick off our Fan Zone Live. Thank you, LJ. Here we go. Well, let me introduce the, the panel, friends, my partner in crime, Andy Goode. We're going to come to you last, actually, because it is very hot in this room and it, you look like you've got sunstroke and... <laughs> I thought I was hot, you are. You're not allowed to answer. I've got to intro the guys. We've got British and Irish Lions hero. I should have introduced you as a hero as well, an English hero, but we have got Stephen Ferris, Ulster, Ireland, British Irish Lions. And obviously, to my right, I've got the famous Welsh, and you've got a number of other clubs, I'm not going to name, go through them, but British and Irish Lions, Jamie Roberts. How are we doing? 
Jamie, it is warm in here. Is it normally this hot in London or Wales? I mean, my goodness, me, I'm sweating. Goody is out of breath over there. I can see him with the heat. It, it, you know, you can feel it in here. But is it normally this warm, this far south? I've come in all in black. I was going to say, I you're know. the clever man. You've come in yeah. black jeans, black T-shirt. Uh, it's actually hotter in Wales, man. For once in a blue moon. It's usually freezing in Wales. It's hotter in Wales at the minute than London. As I dab my head, um, let's get straight into the crux of it, right? There's been a long build-up. Well, there's been a 12-year build-up. There's been a 24-year build-up for some people. There's been a four-year build-up since the last British and Irish Lions tour. We weren't sure whether this was going to go ahead. Now, let's start not on a negative, but let's start on the negatives which have been the build-up. Is it the right decision for this tour to go ahead? Are you happy to see the tour to go ahead? There's a lot going down in South Africa, off the pitch, within the squad. We're now the week of the Test match. Is it the right thing that this is going ahead? Look, I dress it up all you want. I would have, I would have loved to have fans to have been in South Africa. Uh, the fans deserve that. South African fans, Lions fans. It's amazing what we've got here. This should be taking place in a rugby club in Franschhoek or in Stellenbosch or, or wherever. Um, but I think at the minute I'm watching telly, every time a Lions game is getting played, I'm applauding everyone who's, who's managed to get it on. Um, you know, South Africa at the minute is in a bit of turmoil. We all know that. A lot of unrest. Uh, COVID is obviously in its third wave there. But I think rugby is giving, giving the people there something to cheer on. And uh, look, I've, I've loved the fact the tour's gone ahead. Ask me before the tour, I would have said I would have loved to have seen it postponed for a year. But now it's going ahead. All bets are off. Test series. Let's, let's bring it. Yeah, absolutely. We're all looking forward to it. Stevie, uh, so the test matches are going ahead now. The Lions primed, would you say? The games are now at sea level, which is going to make a big difference. But as you look at the build-up to this, twofold, let's concentrate on the British and Irish Lions and their build-up. We can talk about the squad later. But do you think they're primed now? The games are now at sea level. They're all in Cape Town. Everyone knows what the situation is. Yeah, well, of course, it hasn't been ideal having to play the Sharks twice. The Sigma Lions didn't put up much of a fight. The Stormers didn't really put up much of a fight either. And everybody's talking about how much of a positive it is for the Lions to be playing at sea level. But I actually think it's the opposite way. I think it's a, it's a, it's a bigger uh, benefit for the South Africans to be playing at sea level because they haven't had the same amount of game time as the Lions. They're not as match fit. Um, and, yeah, I, I personally feel it. It's all teed up for this Saturday. I think, you know, it whet the appetite with the A game on Wednesday night. We all know what's coming, but for me, this is when the tour officially starts. And everybody now, it doesn't matter if you walk into your local butchers or you walk into your coffee shop, everybody's talking about the British and Irish Lions trying to beat South Africa on Saturday. So, yeah, all we got to do now is just get right behind the boys. I know I'm, I have my doubts that they'll win at the weekend, but what can we do? Just get behind them, hope for the best, and they've got a really good preparation under the belt, so hopefully they can do the job. Three Scots in the team. I'm pretty happy, to be honest. I think we're going to win it. Uh, Andrew. Mate, you're English. Yeah, we're very true. I'm quarter English, yeah. I'm, I, I, if we lose, I'm it's English. Accent, right? Yeah, very true. We can get on to that after. Andrew, we've obviously had many discussions about it, both on podcasts, but WhatsApp, in the lead-up to the test matches. Again, concentrating on the Lions, not talking about South Africa. The tests in the lead-up, the South Africa A game, how much needed was that for the Lions to actually get a proper hit out to know what it's going to be about at the weekend? My question being, has it been hard enough in the lead up? Is that going to benefit the Lions or not? Yeah, I think it worked for a few changes. So they used that as a warm up game. Uh, for the Lions, it was it definitely needed understanding the physicality. We all knew the physicality was coming at some point from a South African team, but actually facing it and seeing what's coming first hand from Etzebeth and those boys. Uh, in the forward pack is definitely something that they had to have experienced because they weren't experiencing that necessarily in the provincial game. So it was a massive wake-up call in a way because we've all spoken, we've all chatted about it. Every provincial game they played, you're expecting a 50-point win, which doesn't set you up for a test series against the world champions. And let's not forget, they are the world champions. You know, there's loads of reports coming out in South Africa that the ex-coach Peter de Villiers said it's a boring way of playing rugby, but they've got a World Cup behind them by playing the South African way. And yeah, that brings physicality, that's defence, that's a kicking strategy, that's energy, that's Faf de Klerk, the smallest guy on the field, trying to throw his shoulder into um, the face of another player, illegally or illegally. Um, and, and we'll see how it all goes out. But I think the Lions definitely needed it. I think that the Springboks needed it as well. And it, it's, it's effectively, as Stevie said, wet the appetite for what's to come because it was a bit of a damp squib prior to that game. How are you liking this? I'll be asking you the questions. How does it feel? Uh, mate, you're, you're my captain, James. I am. You're my captain yeah. of England yeah. right now, in England. Well, 
My uncle Hamish said I should have been captain of the Lions <laughs> if I was playing in the 70s and 80s. Uh, Jamie, how will this tour be remembered if the Lions go down there and win? Obviously with the build-up, but the fact that they are the world champions again, regardless of what happens over these three test matches, it's going to be extremely difficult. How will this squad be remembered? I know we need to get test one out of the way, but if they can go there and win the series, you know how difficult it is. You know, that 97 Lions tour catapulted rugby, I'd say, across the globe with what they did down there. But how will the Lions be remembered if they can win this series? As one of the greatest Lions teams, the squads has played the game. Look, it's th it, what annoys me is people are teeing up excuses already. COVID this, you know, preparation that, whatever. And the lads have discussed the preparation. This test series is huge. And if the Lions win it, for me, for me, they're the strongest squad that's ever left this country, uh, has ever left the British Isles to compete in the Lions tour. If they win it, they'll be one of the greatest squads ever. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to bring in our Wonderwall guests soon, but we're just going to roll a VT. We mentioned before, virtually, over the last 18 months, I sat down and spoke to a few of the guys that have played on previous tours for the famous Grouse and the Spirit of Rugby campaign, just to take a look at this. There is nothing that gets close to the Lions when it comes to supporters. It is the, the balmy army of rugby. It's watching the ashes of cricket. The sea of red I've seen for myself, um when I went to, to, to Brisbane in the first test there. And I, I'll never forget walking in to uh, the, the stadium there and just seeing that. I mean, it was, it was dominated by red. I'll never forget on the way to the first test, you were all nervous and I went out onto the field before the warm up um, just for a walk around the field and you're just surrounded by so much red. When you're walking in amongst it as a supporter and you just look around and you, all you can see are red shirts, it's mind blowing. Yeah, absolutely class. A big thanks again to the famous Grouse, the Spirit of Rugby campaign. It's been brilliant for me personally to be a part of it. But obviously here this evening on the Wonderwall, for the people at home, can you see us? We've got the guy in the middle, someone's in, driving with the kids in the car. Let's hope that they're on mute. I've got four kids. Is that Mike? That is our first guest, is Mike Ashwin. Can you hear us, Mike? This is your cup final, sir. Have you got a question to the panel? It can be I, I to can me. Hear. I'm easy. I can hear you just about, yeah. Going to the darkest depths of Devon. What's your, what's your question then, Mike? Because if you are driving, <laughs> if you are uh, driving, I'm worried is, uh, that you know something might unfold. Hit us quickly. The question is, um, when you when you were called up to the Lions, how how did you feel? I bet it felt unbelievable, Mike. I mean, that, <laughs> <laughs> he's asking it to me. <laughs> uh, should have been. More for Damien Stephen that one. Sorry. Yeah, you yeah, you're right. Yeah, Goody said he should have been. It went as well. If it was in the, if it was played in the 50s and you could drink every day of the week, then he'd definitely be in responsibly. Um, Stevie, let's come to you first. Now, the build-up and the romance. I loved watching it. I loved being a part of it as a player. I got a letter. My uncle Hamish said I should have went. I didn't. I was probably 60th in line to go. What is it like to call yourself British and Irish Lion, both as a current player, what these guys are going through now, but after now that you've retired? Yeah, like nobody can ever take it away from you. I think the British and Irish Lions, for all the players that have um, represented them, handed out caps not so long ago, and they were posted out. And, you know, you kind of, you get your cap and... I think I'm, I'm eight, seven, six, or eight, six, seven. I can't remember the exact number. And you just remember all the lads that have, you know, been before. And it's it's amazing. It's the pinnacle of rugby. It is for me. It's the the biggest highlight of my career, going and representing the British and Irish lands. I was standing outside. I was playing for for Ulster. I was standing just um, doing a strength conditioning session with Johnny Davis, the S and C coach there. And we'd finished up, and the lads were in watching it on, on, on the big screen on the TV. And I just stood outside and was waiting. And um, JD came out, who's the strength and conditioning guy, and came out and said, Stevie. And he just gave me a smile, and straight away I knew it was in. And, you know, I felt elation, top of the world, amazing. And then somebody like Rory Best, who was in the running for it, he's completely the other end, where disappointment. And that's what you got to kind of understand as well. Um, so for me, it was just. By far, the best experience of my life was being selected, but getting on the tour, um, you know, topped that even more, more, Jim. I find it amazing that a strength and conditioning coach gave out some good news to a player, because it never happened to me. So. <laughs> Let's not talk about that just now. I don't want to say from where I'm sat, you've just come back off holiday, you see it's slightly inflamed. Um, Jamie, <laughs> what's it like as a player 
that probably knows that he's going, right? There'll be some lads on that tour that know that they're going to go. Back in your pomp, back in the heyday, I'm not talking about Newport Gwen Dragons playing against Connor away. I'm talking about when you were in your prime and you knew if you were fit you were going to go. Is it the same feeling as if like the lads that kind of didn't know that they had a chance or were kind of on the, on the cusp of it? Uh, that's a good question. In 2013, I went on two tours, uh, South Africa in 09, 2013 Australia. 2013, we just won the Six Nations. You know, I felt I was playing really good rugby. So... Not that I expected it, but I kind of backed myself to get on tour. Oh, nine, I was 22. I played a year of test rugby. I hadn't been around much longer. I sat in my Rove 100 <laughs> with my mate down at Penarth Pier listening on the radio. A lot of people don't realise the players find out at the same time as the public. You know, I listen on, I think, BBC Five Live Radio and listen to the squad getting named out. And literally, you know, name came out, third or fourth in line, obviously, do the back three. Yeah, name came out, got out of the car, just jumping for joy like a little kid. I must have looked like a right idiot. But I, as Fair said, life-changing experience for me. Not just career-defining or like career-changing, it's life-changing. Yeah. Um, Andrew, let's come to you. I didn't make it, James. I know you didn't. I had That's a letter to him <laughs> Because I've spoken about it before. Like, I have. I remember being at Sarri's in 2017. We've spoken about it. We've laughed about it. We've had unbelievable experiences. Well, I beat Romania once playing for Scotland, and that was about it. But <laughs> for Saracens... You know, is it a disappointment to say that there's something, there's, you know, that when every four years it comes about and you watch the build up, the longer I'm retired, I'm happier about it because I'm happy for the players. But there's still a part of me, you know, not that my uncle Hamish was right, but we didn't reach the very, very top. Do you feel like that or are you accepting? Uh, mate, I was accepting. Look at me. <laughs> um, um, in reality, I'll go back to 05 and uh, the Lions coaches, we were playing for Leicester on the last weekend before the squad was announced on the Monday. We were playing against Sale, and ironically, I was playing against Charlie Hodgson, who was in contention to be picked for the squad as well. Um, and we beat, Leicester beat Sale at Welford Road by about 30, 40 points, call it 60. Um, I'd scored a couple of tries as well, which was a miracle. And I'll never forget, in the change rooms afterwards, Jordan Murphy, one of my best mates, came up to me after the game, and he said, the Lions coaches were there watching that game today. I said, yeah, I know they were, Jody. And he said, you've played yourself onto the plane. I'm like, do you, re do you reckon? He said, yeah, mate, you've definitely, the way you played, you've played yourself onto the plane. He said, just don't take your shirt off again on the field um, because you won't get picked. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So then I listened to it on the Monday. And like Jamie said, I'm in the car um, driving to McDonald's and other, <laughs> other fast food outlets are available. Um, I'm on the, in the car just driving, listening to the, the squad being announced. And it comes out in alphabetical order. Absolutely devastated because one of my best mates has told me he thinks I've got a chance. He got picked. I didn't. So I've not spoken to Jordan in many years. But um, it is, it, listen, it's, it's devastating. And that 05 tour... Um, I'm a lot older than you boys, but it was probably the worst Lions tour ever in terms of what's gone on with Clive Woodward splitting the squad up and all that stuff. So it was a very disappointing tour. And I look back on it and I think I'd have still love to have gone. Like, even though you, there's a lot of players on that tour that didn't really play any rugby again. Ollie Smith was someone at Leicester who came back and hardly played a game of rugby again and retired. And, you know, there are disappointments. But for me, it's very personal. Um, you can only deal with it yourself. And I was massively disappointed to come so close and then ultimately not get picked, but probably for the right reasons, because I wasn't good enough. I would have picked you, Andrew, but maybe James. I'm biased, yeah. <laughs> not, not, not so much now. Uh, LJ, let's head out into the crowd. The millions out there. We know we've got about 1.2 million watching at home. They're absolutely loving it, so I'm hearing. LJ, how is it out there? Have we got any questions from the crowd? Well, I found the glamour in the room. Can I have a round of applause for the London Welsh ladies right yeah. here? Yeah! <laughs> now... I am often accused of not sounding very Welsh because I'm from Cowbridge, but you are from... I'm from the US. One of my parents is Welsh, so I count, obviously. Fantastic. Well, we love it. The Welsh love is global. So, obviously, this Lions Tour has kind of simmered underneath everything else. We've had the Euros, the Olympics is about to kick off. But how excited are you ladies for a test series that starts in two days? Brilliant, really excited. It's um, been a long time coming and it's great to have some decent rugby back on the telly. So, Do you think that this is going to capture the hearts? It's obviously, as we've said, the midweekers haven't been huge, but do you think now everyone is ready for Lions Fever? Absolutely. I think, you know, everyone's craving sport and the Lions tour is, is just like the highlight of it all, really. So 100%. Tables booked in the pubs. Perfect. Well, the Spice Boys of London Welsh are outside and they've got another little ditty for us. It's Callum Lan. Take a few, not a little, 
Lovely, lovely. Uh, Jamie, now I am multilingual, langual as well, uh, but I didn't really understand that. Can you give us an insight into what was being said? <laughs> do, do, I, do I feel like I need to run through a wall after I've just been serenaded or not? Cal on line, mate. Millennium Stadium, you can't play in the Millennium Stadium without hearing that song pre-match. Yeah, I don't think about that. I don't know if you saw the 2010 game where we were winning. Yeah, <laughs> Scotland were beating Wales with three minutes to go. I came off thinking, hell of a night. And Shane Williams scored two tries and it was still hell of a night. It was the Andy Powell night. We won't talk about that anymore. <laughs> What is a rugby club and a fan zone Belgium. live on Rugby Pass Lions edition without a quiz, ladies and gentlemen? What is it? You're well. right, it's nothing. It's absolutely rubbish. It's absolutely nothing. LJ, we've got a quiz tonight and we're all involved, aren't we? What have we you got for us? We are all involved, Jim. It's time to inject a little bit of competition into this room and at home. If you are here at Old Deer Park with us, you are playing for this, the famous Grouse Whiskey and Lions jersey special edition nice box i'd probably keep my hair things in it uh, if you are in the room with us we'd like you to write your answers down on the piece of card that you were given when you came in if you're at home write them down and all the answers will be revealed at the end we're each going to ask you two questions so jimothy please take it away with question one question one is everyone ready to go Everyone's panicking. Everyone has. You put it in your phone. You put it on the on the on, on the beer mat. So let's just pretend we have. Right. So question one: Who ran the length of the field? And everyone at home can play this as well. And we will honestly believe you if you get it right. And we can maybe send you a rugby pass hoodie or a beanie. We'll send them a beanie. Beanie. Weather for it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Who ran the length of the field to punch a Springbok when Willie John McBride called 99 is the number 99 in 1974? I dreamt it was me, but it wasn't. But who ran the length of the field to punch a springbok when Willie John McBride called 99? How would you say 99 in well? How would he say it? Now dig now. Now dig now. Okay, now dig now. Or Irish. Yeah, 1974. <laughs> Who's got number two? So that's question one. Question two. Question two. Name the starting back line for the Lions in the third test in the 2009 tour to South Africa. Name the starting back line for the Lions for the third test in the 2009 tour to South Africa. We won that test, by the way. Yeah, Fer Ferris is nodding. He knows that you were there, weren't you? I didn't yeah. make the test. No. He didn't make the test. Don't bring it up. Producer Rupert, you've stitched me there. Number three, Fez. Yeah, question three is name all the second rows who have captained the Lions in South Africa since 1974. So name all the second rows who have captained the Lions in South Africa since 1974. The second not, rows. Not should have. Who did? 100%, Jim. Yeah, guilty. Who have? Uh, question four. Which Springbok did Matt Dawson dummy to score a try in the 1997 first test? Which Springbok did Matt Dawson dummy to score a try in the 1997 first test? Happy that's Who it. holds... Fives, LJ. I was about to read. I was, I was about to go jump the gun. OK, LJ, my question. Question five. What Springdock... What Springdock? Which Springbok did Ronan O'Gara take out in the air in the second test in 2009, which led to the winning penalty? What Springbok did Ronan O'Gara take out in the air in the second test in 2009, which led to the winning penalty? Just to add here, I'm walking around the room. If I catch anyone cheating, you will be buying a round of drinks for the boys on the stage. If I see a phone out... <laughs> I should also Back say, LJ, do not, if anyone ever sees Ronan O'Gara, ask him what happened. That I asked him once on a night out with the Kovskins and he wasn't not happy. Um, question six, who holds the record for the most Lion test caps and who might equal second on this tour? So I think it's a two, two prong question. Question seven. On which tour did the Lions become known as the British and Irish Lions? On which tour did the Lions become known as the British and Irish Lions? <laughs> 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 
Question number eight. Who was the last uncapped player to be taken on the Lions Tour? Who was the last uncapped player to be taken on the Lions Tour? I used to love when they did that. I don't know who it was. I kind of do, I can't say. Question number nine. Name the London Welsh players who went on the 1974 tour to South Africa. Question nine, name the London Welsh players who went on the 1974 tour to South Africa. LJ, you last, go for the final question. Last but not least, how many points did Dan Carter score against the Lions in the second test in 2005? How many points did Dan Carter score against the Lions in the second test in 2005? Whilst you all think about that, I've got one for the panel. On the last tour, there was the infamous Geography Six. Two of them were selected for this tour. Who are they? Finn Russell. Gareth Davis, scrum half. Corey Hill. He's not on this tour, James. Say again. He's not on this tour. So oh, the, the question was which two of the six from the last tour are now on this tour? Corey Hill was definitely not. Boys. Who did you say? Too easy Finn for Russell. These boys. Finn Russell weren't happy. The brains are in the back line here, aren't they, Jamie? You and I. Right. I nailed that, didn't I? You did, Jim. Corey Hill, Adam Beard, similar. It was Welsh. He didn't want to pick the Scotland He didn't want to pick Johnny Gray. Okay, very good quiz, enjoyed that. So we're gonna have a look now at this, as you know, Jamie, Stevie, Andrew, from us watching afar. There's been some iconic British and Irish Lions moments over the years. Just take a look at this. I spoke to some of the guys, like I mentioned, during um, the last 18 months, is what they had to say about going on tour. You'll meet each other in the street in 30 years time, and there'll just be a look, and you'll know just how special some days in your life are. I was, I was an hour and a half away from playing the biggest game of my life. And do you know what I was doing, Jim? Do you know what I was doing? I was crying. I was like crying. And I, was, I didn't dare look around because I, I didn't want to be seen to be crying. I just brought, sneakily brought my hand up just to wipe the tears. And, but the talking was done then. We ran onto the field first and, and then you saw this, it just, you know, the likes of Oz Durant, Mark Andrews, Teichman, all these guys running down this ramp into the field it was like we were the gladiators and they'd open the gates and lions and tigers and everything were being thrown into the pit to say go and then deal with that the south africans were scoring tries jenko neil jenkins the, 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 our fullback was just stroking balls over beautifully keeping the scoreboard ticking over you know we just hung in there just hung in there and you know we found ourselves second best in the game but who knows i'm sure we're going to talk about you know your man then stepped up and he created some history. Jerry Guska, one of the greatest players I ever played with, but would never call for the ball unless there was something on. For the not just for him, for the team. That drop goal started with Jerry Guska and Neil Back winning a rock on the halfway line, and Keith Wood at scrum half kicking a ball down the touchline. A line out. Gregor Townsend taking the ball into the heart of the South African forwards. Dorse gets the ball. And there must have been a moment where he's sort of looked up and gone, Jesus, Gus, can I, can, I, can I risk giving the ball to him? And then I just remember hearing Jerry screaming my name, Dawes. And instinctively, that's like, well, I, it, I know I can't mess about with this. The ball comes to me, and I, my natural reaction is just to strike it. Yesterday, 24 hours ahead of schedule, Warren Gatland announced his now much talked about first test 23. Obviously it was a robust debate, we were an hour and a half in selection, it was the hardest selection meeting I've ever been in. Asked the coaches to come along with their, their 23s and we were all different. Finally Warren, the team was in the public domain uh, before today's announcement, how, how did that happen and are you bothered much? Uh, yeah, I don't know how that happened. So it wasn't it wasn't a hundred percent right, but obviously someone's leaked that out. Uh, whether that's 
on purpose or accidentally or someone's betrayed someone's trust. So what I'll do next week is just name the team to the to the players and then and then name the team to the press straight away. To be here and you know taking the knocks and bumps and being in amongst it with the group um, it is is it means more. I've got, I'm not going to lie. It means more in the fact of. I'd spent two weeks with the guys and was getting to know people. We were bedded into the rugby, um, obviously at the seven minutes, and and sometimes all he needs is a chance. And you know, I was willing to work hard and you know get myself and make it difficult for the guy next to me to you know make myself uh, available for selection, like I say. Right, Jamie, I'm going to come to you first. That man on screen, Alun Win Jones, Lazarus Swan screamed out. Some respect, but we're in a Welsh club, Alin. Yeah, but so yeah, but it was spelled Alun, Alun on screen. So I just went like that. You you know how we do it up in Scotland. Jamie, what are the headlines out of the team and out of the squad that you saw? There were a few surprises. Let's just talk about Alan Win Jones first up because he is the man on screen. He is captain. I mean, there's not many of us that come back with a dislocated shoulder after two weeks. This man has. Um, I mean, it's an unbelievable recovery. Are you surprised he's playing? I'm not surprised he's playing at all. Look, uh, it's obvious that injury in Edinburgh, you know, we were both in Edinburgh, but it, it wasn't as bad as first feared. He's gone home, he's been diligent with his rehab, he's made himself available for selection. What I will say, like, Siri McGeekin talks about test match animals. This guy delivers when the stakes are at their highest. Six Nations Championships, World Cups, Lions tours. When the pressure's up there, this is a guy you depend on. Um, maybe not club rugby, international rugby, he's immense. When the stakes are at the highest, this is the guy who has delivered for Warren Gatland in the last decade. Doesn't surprise me one bit he's starting. I expect him to be phenomenal Saturday. Yeah, undeniable, uh, that's for sure. Anyone else? Josh Adams, there was obviously a lot of talk that he was nailed on on the wing, really. And you look at the reshuffle of the, ba- the bat three, we don't know if Liam Williams was injured in the lead-up, which has given Stuart Hogg the place. Have you heard anything coming out of camp or not? No, look, it's so competitive. I said this is the most competitive British and Irish line squad to leave the British and Irish Isles. You can tell that by the the 23 they haven't picked. Um, if you go, if you look at the 15 they haven't picked, it's it's an immense team. So look, I, Luke Cowan-Decky has been immense on tour. He's played his way into the jersey. Same as Ali Price has played his way into the jersey. Curry, Watson, I mean, 50 feet. Uh, and they've gone with Tom Curry. So what I love about this squad is each one of these players has got a different story. You know, Hoggy, third tour, hasn't been a test line yet. Injury ruled him out of his last one. Biggs, Missed out on tw- He was the only Welsh player after he won the Six Nations in 2013 not to get picked on the Lions tour, which would have hurt him massively. Four years later, doesn't become a test line. He sat behind Faz and Johnny Sexton. First test, test line four years later. I, l- I love that. I love how players have persevered and now they get the chance. It's an immense team. And the bench, well, it was ch- we chat to the other lads about the bench. The bench is going to be huge. No, absolutely. Andrew, we've spoken about this at length. You know, we've everyone in, up and down the country across Ireland as well, have been picking their starting 15, their, their 23, who can beat South Africa. Any one stand out there? I mean, we've obviously gone through it, but when it got named, and it was a shame it got leaked, let's be honest, it, was a, it took a bit of the romance out. Um, but when you look at that, anyone surprise you? Well, I think the big thing is, um, from a Warren Gatton select- selection, you can normally kind of name how he wants to play a game. Uh, and everyone's talked about the way we've got to play South, South Africa is the physicality, but he's actually moved away from it a little bit. So he could have gone with a, you know, a straight down the line selection at nine. Someone like Connor Murray, who is his nine that he's played in the last tour. He's a dependable nine that's going to kick box, kick well, control the field, etc. He's gone for Ali Price, who has played exceptionally well on tour. He's not really been tested on the back foot, but he's an exciting nine, isn't he? So he's someone that is going to add pace to the game, which perhaps isn't something that we're used to for Warren Gatland under Wales, where we called it Warren Ball. You know, he could have gone with Bundy Aki and Robbie Henshaw in the centres, big, powerful guys that are sort of straight up and down as opposed to a bit of flair with Elliot Daly at 13. And J- Jamie will know about a 13. That's a bit of a left-field selection for me in terms of form and and where he's been playing international rugby. So in the back line, I'm really excited about it because there's players that have been picked in there. Duan van der Merwe, he's a monster. He's a massive guy out on the wing. He's been really good on tour. He can bring physicality, but also deft touches as well. So there's loads of sort of conflicts around who could and couldn't be picked in the back line. I think he's got an exciting team and I'm looking forward to seeing him. Stevie, uh, before we talk about the makeup of the back row, let's talk about Jack Conan because not many people, Andrew had him in his squad the week before and changed his mind last minute. We've got a Jack Conan fan or a couple behind me. I mean, no one even had him in that I'd seen. 
no one in the media had him in, in the starting 15. No one had him in the squad, really. Can you understand why they've gone for Jack, Jack Cohn instead of someone like Talupe Falatau? Sam Simmons hasn't really been given an opportunity this much on tour to prove himself as a starting eight. Yeah, rugby can be a, a funny sport at times, especially when an, a player like Keelan Doris picks up an injury and all of a sudden Jack Conan gets his opportunity and he grabs it <coughs> excuse me, with both hands. First of all, he's a massive man. He is a huge, huge uh, physical beast of a man. He really is. If you stand beside him, he dwarfs most players. So to have a big guy at number eight, to, to lock those two second rows together, I think he will bring serious physicality, which is what's needed. I think um, with Ireland, he, he's just going about his business. He's been brilliant for the Lions on any time he's been given an opportunity. He's the highest meters made uh, in any of the back row. So when he gets the ball in hand, he's making busts. He, he makes his tackles. And yeah, I think he thoroughly deserves his chance. Toby Falatai, we've seen him out in the wing carrying a few uh, loose balls out there. But we haven't seen him do the hard yards where I think Jack Conan has. And like Warren Gatland doesn't particularly like Irish men. Let's call a spade a spade. But he's what he, he, oh, a few <laughs> But but uh, but I think I think he's made the correct decision in, in picking Jack Conan because he is in form. He's playing with lots of confidence, and um, I think he'll do a terrific job packing down at number eight. Goody, can we just get a profile? Can you just stand up? How big is Jack Conan compared to Goody? Come on, let's say you need to be able to breathe. <laughs> I've done you a favour here to try and breathe. In terms of the, the, the specimen that stands before us, much bigger than Goody. Honestly, or not? Jim, it's like I stood beside him and he was wearing like a tweed jacket and his chest was just puffed out like by 10 inches further than mine. And he was just standing there and I was in awe. And he was coming back, like he's had his injury worries. He, I think it was a broken foot he came back with, um, struggled in and out, in and out, didn't kneel down a spot with, uh, with Leinster. And now he's just kneeled on with Ireland and thoroughly deserves his chance with the land. So fair play to him and I hope he goes really well at the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jamie, let's talk about the bench. You look at the South African bench, my goodness me, there's probably a number of reasons, and we're going to talk about the Springboks later on in terms of the guys that they've started with, the guys that have struggled with COVID. If they can only play 20 minutes, they've got an unbelievable bench. Naturally, you'll have the guys on the bench that weren't happy. I was well happy being on the bench, I'll be honest. I felt like I made it. Some of these lads wouldn't be that happy being on the bench, but how important are these players? When you look at the profile of it, does it give you an insight into how Gatlin wants to potentially play and finish the game? Without a doubt. And it could have hit the nail on the head. Like traditionally in Test rugby, it's an arm wrestle, first 50, 60, and you bring an injection of pace and energy off the bench. Yeah, you Murray, do. You do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Murray Farrell at halfbacks on the bench tells me that Gats in this first test probably wants to do the opposite. He wants to go out and play from minute one, get ahead on the scoreboard, and then probably two best tactical kickers to come off the bench and, and dictate terms in the last third of the game. So that traditional thing we've got about in test rugby, that the pace comes off the bench and we ramp things up, I think we'll see the flip side of that from the Lions this weekend. But just on that, Jamie, with the South Africans naming their squad earlier than the British and Irish Lions, did that maybe force Gatlin's hand to make a few of those decisions for him because of their team selection? Because they have loaded their bench, so they're trying to finish the game stronger rather than what you were kind of saying, the Lions are looking to go out and play faster at the start. Yeah, we were kitsch off Malherb and Malcolm Marks on a bench of the box. It's not a bad front row. I think that was mind games from Rassi Erasmus because I haven't known Warren Gatlin for a long time. He loved to do that in the week. If team announcement was due on the Thursday, he would often, Tuesday morning, he'll tell the press officer, right, it's going out today. A bit of a psychological warfare. You put your team out early. It's a kind of statement, right? This is our team. All the best having two days more prep to analyse us. Stop us come the weekend. I think Rassi Erasmus jumped Warren Gatlin to it last week. Wouldn't surprise me one bit um, because they were meant to name it both teams Thursday. So I think he beat Warren Gatland at his own game there, potentially. Yeah, absolutely. Right, we're going to jump back into the Wonder Wall. They're waiting. Hopefully there's no one driving or driving boats on there, but you never know. The sun's out and all that. Before we get into the Wonder Wall, we get our question. We're going to take a look at the iconic Matt Dawson from his time in 97. I imagine it's 97. That was the big tour, wasn't it? There is nothing that gets close to the lines when it comes to supporters. It is the the balmy army of rugby. It's what watching the ashes at cricket. It's it's the rugby version that Lions touring crowd take over the country. Okay, we're going to go to box one on here. Ken Lindsay. Oh, Ken, our good Ulster man. Driving. He's been waiting since six o'clock. There he is. Gentlemen. Ken, Ken, how Ken. are we doing? You've got Ken. the great George Best behind you on your shoulder, Jim. Ken was an electrician at Kingspan Stadium in Belfast, so I know Ken well. Oh, okay. Nice, Ken. 
Stevie was saying that his lights had fallen down just before, so I can get over there and fix it. I'm a tradesman as well. Ken, thank you. You've been waiting patiently uh, on our Wonderwall, the famous grouse spirit of rugby Wonderwall. Um, have you got a question to the guys or myself? Or we're on mute. He's an electrician that can't Ken, work his... Ken, this was your moment. This was your cup final and you're on mute. We're going to start again. OK, let's go. If you can ask it again, please. I'm a lip reader. I'm a lip reader, OK? And i just telling you now what he said. He said, Stevie, what's your best memory of a Lions tour? That was right, wasn't it, Ken? Not if I was right. Smashed it, didn't I? How good was that? How good was that? Very impressive. <laughs> oh, loads of good memories. Good nights out. Um, Jamie might be able to touch on this, but like 2009, speaking to Tommy Bow, 2013, it was just all about getting the win, getting the win. 2009, it was a bit more off field. You were able to go out and enjoy yourselves, play rugby, play hard, train hard, but go out and come together as a squad. And some of the times we had out, um, you know, a few of the local bars, clubs, getting to know one another. Like, I rocked up. drink. So they talk about the drinking, don't they, yeah. when they're there? And again, we're here and we're obviously enjoyed a beer. We've not been out of the house in a long time. Like, is it part of it or is it all, like, the, is it kind of like, it, yeah, we, we went out and had a few beers, but you didn't really have a few beers? Well, what's the best... What's the best thing to get to know somebody? Go and have a couple of beers, relax. Um, and if you know somebody, you can generally trust them a lot better too. So, like, I pitched up to Penny Hill Park, rooming with Alan Jones... Never met him before, played against him a couple of times. Um, and, you know, two days later, we're standing at the bar having a few pints. You know, Mike Phillips, Shane Williams, lads that I was in awe of every time I played against them, but I didn't know them. And after a couple of beers, you start telling a few stories, get to know each other, and it, it was brilliant. And there was more than a few beers at times, but in saying that, Jim, I think it's becoming more and more professional. And Jim, you might even be able to touch in 2013 that it, it went on to another level. But I think the best moment, Ken, to answer your question was obviously winning my first cap for the British and Irish Lions. Unfortunately, it wasn't a test one, but running out against the Golden Lions and, and scoring on my debut as well. Uh, Ken, we can hear you now. Uh, can you say hello to everyone? Hey, panel, how are you, buddy? Yay! <laughs> Ken, we've got you. The old uh, Belfast you... accent. Yeah, it is the Belfast ac accent. Ken, just while you're here, can you give us your favourite memory of the Lions over the years? Just give us one line on your favourite memories. Probably, uh, as most famous memory, or one I would like, I like is Stevie first. The day that the, 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 the try scored against the, the Golden Lions. There you go. It is. It is. Cheers, I remember Ken. it. I remember you in full flow, scrum cap I'm on. Ari, I'm an Irish man and an Ulster man. I had of, to say that. Of course you were. Ken, thanks very much. We got there in the end. We're going to go to Mark Hart. I think it is. It always got a headset. We'll definitely be able to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> he is primed. Uh, Mark, a gamer. Gamer. <laughs> hit us. He's a gamer. He's a gamer. He's definitely You're a gamer. gamer. <laughs> what you got, sir? Uh, so my question was, which three players who were not selected for the tour would you have liked to see have made the squad oh we're going to go one each one each we're going to go johnny sexton really uh, really or not genuinely yeah like what yeah what <laughs> I, I just think johnny sexton like i played underage rugby with him 19s 21s up through he's a ferocious competitor when the going gets top tough he always comes up trumps so for me johnny sexton there's so many game changing moments for him over the years in a lions jersey an irish jersey and a leinster jersey so to have somebody with that class and pedigree on the tour i think is uh, would, would only be a good thing so johnny sexton from in my opinion jamie oh god that's a good question uh i'd say a nine with something a little bit different so either a Danny Kerr. I was a massive fan of your Ulster lad, John Cooney. I think a fantastic player. Hasn't really had a look in with Ireland. If you would have asked me to start of last season, he would have been my bolter for the Lions. So, yeah, I'd go John Cooney. Oh, nice. OK, a couple of Irishmen. Um, Andrew, anyone? Uh, yeah, I'd have liked to have seen Ben Youngs go on the nine front. Not because necessarily he excites him, but he's a very exciting player. But the backstory of he missed out, he was selected for the 2017 Tour to New Zealand, pulled out of that because of the illness to his brother's wife, um, and he wanted to spend time with the family. Uh, great news is, obviously, his wife has, has, has recovered from that, and he had to rule himself out again of this tour because he's, his wife is now uh, due to give birth. So, um, yeah, I'd love to have seen him on a Lions tour. You know, he's a lovely character, brilliant guy, and he can add pace and power when he needs to as well from nine. So, um, and we've got to settle for a Scott playing at nine for us at the weekend, haven't we? So, um, I think Scott. 
English Scott. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. He's a good lad. Um, Jamie, quickly, just before we go back to LJ, there, naturally, with Warren Gatlin, and we had this in the tour in 2017 and 2013 as well, where he picked um, a couple of Welsh lads ahead of me. Um, well, not a Welsh bias, but he goes with lads that he knows. So when there's injuries in the squad, um, when we saw in 2017 when he called up the lads who he claimed were closer to um, New Zealand, even though there was we lads in, in Zealand, Scotland right? lads in Australia. On Wales at, at New Zealand. Time. But that's yeah. what I mean. So, it, you know, is there with him that he's got guys that, like, he's close to and he kind of, because he knows them inside out, with the Welsh lads, that's his go-to. I mean, you're close to Gask. Look, it's an element of trust, isn't it? For any coach, you trust players who have delivered for you. Uh, whether at test level or lines level, whatever. Especially four years ago, we're talking about players coming in and betting in very quickly. It's not like a, you had the whole month to train with the lines. You've got to come in and play within a week or two. Um, he doesn't do sentiment. Warren Gatlin does not do sentiment. We saw that with the Driscoll 2013. Like, I've been a victim of that myself at test level. He doesn't do it. He does not care. He will pick the best team to win a test rugby match with the best players who will deliver for him. He does not do bias or sentiment one bit. Did you not drop him a text then and say, Gats, I can still do a job? Well, this tour? Yeah. Too fucking old now. <laughs> <laughs> Way too old. No, not at all. Uh, LJ, you're outside with some lovely rugby, rugby fellas, aren't you? How is the sun out there? So I've come outside and found the lads who are from Casey Old Boys who will be in the same league as London Welsh next year. I know that they're not quite the heights they once were, but how excited are you to play against this historic side? Oh, very excited. I think Carter's most excited being a proper Welsh speaking boy. Yeah, yeah very excited oh, about it. It's like coming home to my roots, you know, come out to this place. So it's nice. So you're from Carmarthen. Do you feel that there aren't enough Welsh boys on the side that we're seeing on Saturday? Um, I think there's enough. I think it's good. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good. We've got enough Welsh boys there, like, it's good. So what have you made of what the panel have said about the selections? Has it kind of swayed you in favour of believing in this 23 that we're going to see? Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, big question. I've got to cover that. Uh, yeah, no, I agree uh, with a few of the boys. I think the bench is the uh, the big the big point of contention. Uh, I want to see Mish on the pitch. Um, fantastic player. Um, yeah. And have you got a number from Goody for the hair transplant yet? Jackie's <laughs> <laughs> on the <laughs> right. Stevie. So, oh, oh, there we go. And there we go. <laughs> right, from these boys to some older, so slightly more mature ones behind. It's time for another blast from the London Welsh quintet. <laughs> I'll be honest, I wasn't expecting that last bit, I'll be honest, but nonetheless, <laughs> one of my favourite Christmas songs, that as well. Absolutely love it. No, it is an absolute classic. Um, Spring Box. Ooh. It's on. Andrew, I'm going to come to you first. Sia Khaleesi, friend, friend, friend of ours, friend of mine. Met him a few times. Obviously, you look at what he's been through. You look at what he's been through before. His story, the first black man to captain this country in South Africa, the profile that that brought to him, and he said it himself, like the, pro the, the pressure that he's been under for the last couple of years, the fact that he's not played that much, his form's not been good, COVID. Let's talk about Sia Khaleesi first, and then we, maybe we can segue into the other guys. They've not had an easy build-up to this tour, have they? No, certainly not, and he's an absolute icon of South Africa. You know, part of the rugby of the whole country, isn't he? You know, where he's come from and what he's created. Winning the World Cup in 2019, uh, as captain and lifting that trophy. Now, we've spoken to a number of different people. John Schmidt, another World Cup winning captain from South Africa. He said that Khaleesi was, was so uh, entrenched in everything that went on after the World Cup. And he took his eye off the ball a little bit in terms of rugby. So 
and, and rightfully so, he's become an absolute world star off the back of winning the World Cup and being the first black captain of South Africa to, to, to lift the trophy. So he's gone and enjoyed that celebrity status, but you know he's done a lot of stuff around the country as well to, to try and improve it from his standpoint. But he's hardly played any rugby. He's still the, the quality operator that he is. You know, we, we won't know until we see at the weekend how match fit he is. You know, he struggled with COVID. Obviously, th he's not match sharp and match fit. You know, there were issues apparently, and this is ironic coming from me, but apparently he had issues with weight, um, which he put on with living the lifestyle that he did after winning the 2019 World Cup and sort of taking his eye off the ball rugby-wise. So he's worked ex exceptionally hard to get back into the shape he's in and, you know, looking forward to seeing... He he's a world icon now of rugby, isn't he? So, you know, someone that we all want to see perform well... Maybe not to win the test, but obviously, you know, his backstory and where he's at now, it'd be great to see. Yeah, well, his agent is Jay-Z's company, Rock Nation, him, Mara, Toji and Cheslin Colby. And I've put my name in the mix and they've said if tonight goes well, then they're going to sign me up. So the guys at Rock Nation, how are you doing? Stevie, let's carry on talking about him because I know you want to talk about him and you want to talk about Courtney Laws. You're well placed to talk about the sixth position, the physicality, the way that you played, having played against South Africa as well. Would you be, not scared to the wrong word, but I mean, from the outside looking in now and watching what South Africa A, effectively the Springboks, did against the Lions and shocked them with their physicality, the way they beat England in the final, the way they go about their business, what do you think and what do you kind of not fear for the Lions or worry about the Lions, but have they got a chance? Can they front up physically to this South African pack especially? Yeah, well, you look at the South African pack and Emma Ambi coming back into hooker is a serious operator, brilliant scrummager. I know the Lions scrum was under a bit of pressure um, in the first half uh, against South Africa A, but they came up trumps in the second half. He's certainly going to knuckle down there. Etzebeth and Mustard, I know you want to talk about them, Jim, but let's get to the back row. These are the guys that take the most impacts during a game, whether that's a tackle, whether that's a ruck, or whether that's a ball carry. Sia Khaleesi does not carry the ball. He's carried the ball 16 times in the five games that he's played in the Rainbow Cup. He's played 327 minutes in those games. And for me, you need to be match sharp when you're playing the British and Irish Lions. So Sia Khaleesi, he's the type of player, Jim, that could just rock up and get man of the match, couldn't he? He's just that type of player, but he's going to have his work cut out against Courtney Laws. I'm super excited to see Courtney Laws. I would have liked to seen Tag Burn. The reason for that, the game plan, Jamie, that you're talking about, maybe throwing the ball around a little bit more, not running into heavy traffic. Like Tag Burn threw, throwing seven offloads so far, so far in the tour, and Laws only two offloads. And, you know, Laws, he just runs around tackling all day, but he doesn't have a really good set of hands for an extra pass. He doesn't make many line breaks. We've, scored, we've seen Tag Burn score a couple of tries. So that's sixth position for me at the minute. There's two players there that aren't playing brilliantly, but, but could actually come out of this game as man of the match and their credibility could go through the roof. So, yeah, it's a big one in the back row. The other one, Quagga Smith, he's playing all his rugby out in Japan. And, uh, and for me, this is a huge, huge opportunity because Dwayne Vermeulen's missing. Absolutely. And the South African management are obviously looking at the team that won the World Cup. You look at the back line, it is the back line that won the World Cup. Uh, it's interesting actually reading former coach Peter de Villiers, what he said about the South African's current style of play that's very boring. They've got Chesney Colby, they've got one of the most exciting players I think we've ever seen in any generation. Would you know if you're a back in your face in this, what do you think about this back line? I'd, I'd swap boring for efficient, and the way they play the game is it's it's spot on. Like uh, Pollard for me is huge coming back in, he wins his 50th cap this weekend, hasn't played for the box since that World Cup final. Um, ob obviously not involved in that A game last week. Special player, but is it because he's a running threat? His as a running threat, Mornay Stain played in that A game, kicked everything. He's not a threat to the line, never carries. Pollard is a serious ball carrier, runs that 45, bang steps, strong enough to fend prop forwards. You know, he's that sort of player. Fafta Clerk is an in incredible operator, and in that back three, I mean, it's serious pace, isn't it? Serious pace, footwork. You know, the Lions kick loosely, uh, loosely, watch out, and some size in the midfield. Like we talk about Elliot Daly. Uh, and Robbie Henshaw on the midfield. I mean, these boys, uh, they're going Route 1 on a weekend. They're coming at, they're coming at down at 10, 12 channel, no doubt. Yeah, Stevie, we were talking about it before, actually, and we were talking about the discussion around Tom Curry and Hamish Watson, who you put in the team. And we were talking about like players like Peter Steph de Toy, Eben Etzebeth. It doesn't matter who's running at them. They're, getting, they're monstering them, aren't they? The physicality of this team, there's an old-school element to it. When you look at the Lions, you look at the makeup of this team, what do you think they can do differently 
than what England did. You know, it, um, uh, probably Wales is a good standpoint because they ran them close, obviously, in, in the game before the, the final. Well, Wales stuck to a game plan of kicking the ball and it came to a, a kick by Pollard, was it 1915 or 1917, whatever that they won in the end. And they stuck to it the whole way throughout the game. They just, they just kept at it, kept at it. And they didn't get a break for it to go their way. And that's what the Lions have got to do. Whatever the game plan is that Warren Gatlin's put in place, they got to stick to it. They can't go off script because if they do go off script, they kick loosely. Cheslin Colby can cause Syria, like he can step somebody in a phone booth. He has electric pace. But for me, they got to match them physically. If you don't match them, forget about it. And you got to match them up front. Peter Stettler, it's a game of physics. Like the biggest men usually come out on top. We've all seen the photograph of the, uh, of the South African team pre rugby World Cup. 2019, all absolutely shredded, huge, huge men, and everybody saying, oh yeah, they don't have enough skill, they don't have this, they don't have that. They stuck to a game plan of being direct, being physical, putting pressure, kicking when they wanted to, um, and it worked and they won the Rugby World Cup. So I expect more of that, and um, for them to offload the bench as well, to bring an even bigger physicality in the second half, Jim. But the Lions for me, they can get those tip-on passes, negate the line speed a little bit, vary their kicking game a bit more. Like, I just don't want to see Robbie Henshaw going route one and getting smashed back on his backside and the forwards having to go around the corner. I know we're getting uh, a little bit specific here, but I don't want to see that. I want to, I want to see them stick to a game plan and execute it. Yeah, well, let's talk about that picture just briefly, that picture that went viral of the South Africans with their shirts off with a combined body fat of 3%. I told my wife it was CGI. I said that that's not how humans should look. <laughs> Goody, I don't expect you to answer that, but what I want you to answer <laughs> is around the fly half. Andre Pollard is obviously a world-class player. We're all happy to see Dan Begger, he's the form 10. With him at 10, well, we know because of the way that South Africa play, um, what do you think of him as a 10? Is he as good as we think? Can he bring South Africa the kind of game that can beat the Lions? Yeah, they're actually very similar 10s for me. Um, you know, controlling 10s that can attack when they want to. Uh, Bigger's in wonderful form. You know, he, he's a real guy that operates at the kind of top level where he's in charge of everything you know we've spoken to him on our podcast and you know he, he lives for winning every single little battle every day at training or on the game so understanding his game management and how Warren Gatlin wants him to implement that is huge um uh, Andre Pollard's he's come back from an ACL injury so he, he, he ruptured his ACL it's a massive injury for any player but as a kicker as a 10 when you know you've got someone like Courtney Laws coming at you or Tom Curry and you're trying to take on the gain line. And you heard Jamie say it earlier, certain tens, Mornay Stain, he sits back in the pocket. I sat 30 yards behind the gain line because I didn't want that physical confrontation. If you've come back from a massive knee injury like Andre Pollard has, where you play on at the gain line, you also run the risk of getting smashed as well. So it's that game balance. And one of the big things we haven't spoken about is the refereeing. So Nick Berry, who's the referee this weekend, I saw Warren Gatlin talk in the press today about how he, he, he marshals the offside really well. The South Africans are going to bring line speed. So when you're talking about Dan Bigger and game management, is Nick Berry going to understand that sometimes they're offsides, so we've got to penalise them, take the sting out of their line speed and let Dan Bigger have some front football where he's not under as much pressure. And that's going to be where the game's won and lost, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Talking about winning or losing, we're going to play a dice game. But first, before we do that, we're going to look at a VT. Arguably, well not arguably, it is one of the most physical test matches we've ever seen. To me, it's probably the most physical test match I think I've ever experienced. You know, unfortunately, we, en we ended up with injuries as well. We, when both centres disappear and both props go in less than 10 minutes, I think, in the second half. I actually, I actually weirdly didn't feel at any point when players were going off, you know, with arms and slings and all the rest of it. I actually just didn't think that there was any way we could lose it still, you know. You see sort of your fellow kind of soldiers, whatever you want to call them, going off and you, you think you might get down, down heartened by it. But I, I actually, there was so much belief within that squad that I just did, didn't think it necessarily affected us. A shot for E! For e! Oh, my word! So Ronan O'Gara concedes the penalty. This for the series win. It's got the distance. Stay. Man, it was awful. It really was. Like, I've been playing this game for 15 years now, and and that ranks as number one worst loss and, and biggest defeat that I've ever had to take. You know, to, lo to lose a game in the last minute like that on, on the man, uh, that was a bitter pill to swallow. The players knew it wasn't Ronan and Agara's fault we lost that game. It was, you know, it should have been um, well well sorted before that. 
we go back in the change rooms after being in your own little world for you know five, say five minutes you, you want to then interact and talk to your teammates and you know sort of discuss the game debrief the game and I remember the change rooms were pretty big purely because so many guys had gone to hospital you know to get either operated on or, or checked on you know it's still probably, in some respects, the most powerful dressing room I've walked back into, because it was silent. You just saw the players, and you you knew what players give. Yeah, listen, of course, it was an opportunity missed. I think how close the second test was, you know, that could have swung either way. Yeah. Jim! Oh, sorry, was it Lions, was it? Sorry, I thought you were cheering me on. Um, Jamie, what was it like, mate? The physicality, I mean, I've heard some horror stories coming out of there. Just immense game. Do you know what? When we reflect on that game, it was a privilege to play in it. You know, a game that iconic. Uh, how it swung back and forth, and obviously, you know, we know what happened at the end with Agar and uh, Mornay Stain's kick. Funny thing from that test match is the five of us end up in an ambulance uh, straight after the game. We actually missed the after-match function and, and the few drinks that the, the players shared with the box. Myself, uh, I'd done my wrist when Habana scored that try off the left-hand side scrum. I'd hurt my wrist, so I came off, couldn't feel my hand, really. Um, Adam Jones dislocated shoulder. He'd gone ahead to hospital because it took him about two hours to get back in. The size of the bloke, he had to get, <laughs> have general anaesthetic to get his shoulder back in. Well, Driscoll's head was out here from that collision, which you saw. It probably looks like my head does now. Um, <laughs> Gethin Jenkins smashed his eye socket three places. You know, his face was caving. And Tommy Bowie had done his calf, right? So we're all in an ambulance. We all go to this... Uh, we all go to this random hospital on the outskirts of Pretoria. Like, it looked more like, felt like more like a prison. Like, it was really kind of hanging hospital. And a real funny moment. Uh, Gethin Jenkins got the bed. You know, Adam was already in theatre. Gethin was the worst injured out of the four of us remaining. So he got the bed, and he's a selfish prick. So <laughs> he definitely... He obviously got the bed. He needed the bed. His face was caved in. And um, we sat there for an hour, two hours. The surgeon comes to see Gethin, and after their consultation, Geth looks me in the eyes and says, come over here. He's like, Jamie, you would not believe I smelt the surgeon's breath. He'd been on the piss at the game. <laughs> and wanted to operate on Geth in there and then a Doc Robson, James Robson, who you'd know well from your time at Scotland, Lions legend doctor, actually had to pull the surgeon aside and say, look, mate, you can't operate on Geth in. He'll end up looking like a Picasso drawing in the morning. So he had to operate the next day. That's overnight. Unbelievable. Play rugby, they say, eh? <laughs> of course. And we had a laugh with the calf strain that was in hospital with one of some of the lads uh, behind laughed. Talking of laughing, LJ, we're about to play a little game, aren't we? Which stemmed from an interaction that happened with Simon Zebo and a bit of banter on tour. We're going to try and reenact re something similar. What we got? So infamously in 2013, Simon Zebo had to call Rob Penny because he lost out in the dice game. It was a forfeit for something he'd done. None of these boys have done anything bad, but we thought we'd make them play it anyway. So whoever low rolls the lowest on the dice will have to do one of the forfeits. Shall I take you through what those forfeits are? Yeah, you can. I'm going to try and catch the dice as it comes through. Oh, oh, oh. 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 Uh, yeah, it's okay. We'll some, take a lot some, some, some things never change, never change. No, I would have went on my left. Yeah, I would have went up with my left. Um, so we're going to go through it first, are we? Okay. No, no. Boys, you're all going to roll the die first. And then we're going to find out the forfeits after. Absolutely. Well, Jamie, as you were the man holding the phone for Simon Zebo, I think I'm right in saying you can roll the dice first. All right. Here we as go. I, yeah, I was going to say, is that a real head of hair or not? I'm really intrigued no. here. <laughs> <or not? laughs> it's not. Three for me. Three. So the lowest loses, OK? So the lowest person who rolls the dice loses, then someone in the crowd is going to throw it in, banter, and then we're going to see bans, the forfeit. Bans, so bans. three. My math says that that's middle of the road. <laughs> Yes, five. Oh. Four. Oh. I'm not low. Four, four, four. Andrew, you're right, mate. I'm good. Careful. Come on, go. He just pulled his spleen. He's all right. Go on, his son. Nah, the oh, winner. Oh, five. I'm having a shocker here. <laughs> Were you a three? Oh. Stevie, you're right. A bit of sweat coming off you there. <laughs> Nervous. He's rolled a dice before. Oh! oh. How ironic that it Shocker. comes back to you, Mr. Roberts. Shocker. So, all right. 
LJ, we're gonna have a look at the forfeits on screen. Right, Jamie Hugh Roberts. If you roll a one, you have to pin a tweet to your Twitter, Lions 3-0. That's fine, so that's all right. Yeah, I think that'd be, yeah. If you roll a two, you're going to have to FaceTime a friend in the lion's bubble. Oh, I've got no friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try Gats. Hey, mentor, I'll try Gats. If you roll a three, Jamie, you're going to have to tell us a juicy anecdote that went on on tour. Lovely. Now, Cut this one I know you will be hoping comes up. If you roll a four, you've got to sing us your debut initiation song. Number five, you're going to finish the show in a pair of budgie smugglers. I'm sure that that says Goody needs to finish the show. Girls, which one do you want so far? No. <laughs> and if it's a six, it's the push-up challenge. Oh, so I'm going to get someone to throw it in. I'm naked. Um, <laughs> we've heard four, okay. we've heard four well, excuses. I want the FaceTime. I want the FaceTime. Yeah, I've got yeah, so the, the, the crowd's going to throw the dice in. The crowd are throwing it in. OK, do you want to count down? Or you just want to do it? Oh, he's, he's thrown it in. Oh! It's easy. That's easy. Roll again. That's easy. Uh, well, we want to roll the again. crowds, win your freedom. Okay, let's see. Win what the do the crowd want? Yeah. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> yes! <laughs> we got a FaceTime. We got a FaceTime. You got a FaceTime. So anyone? You got to get out your get phone. Your phone you got to FaceTime. I know. I know. Yeah. Try. Okay, Who's so there? anyway, the VD, Alan so, Wynn, Gats. Yeah, I think Alan Wynn's the one because he he's a real big oh, fan of mine. Simon Alan Wynn. Wynn yeah, yeah. Okay, so as Jamie does that unfolds, Andrew, which one would you have been most scared of? Well, I know. Would you have wore the budgie smugglers or not? 100% top off, shorts down, budgies on. Yeah, 100%. I have no, I've not seen your top off in six years. <laughs> there's, ki there's kids watching Goody. Go on. Yeah, wh where are the budgies? Let's throw them in. It's two days before lunch. Yeah, that's I know it's a big game, mate. It's a big it's test match at the weekend. Test. Exactly. Oh. Mate, <laughs> oh, let's have a look. I'll wear those. I'll wear those. I'll happily wear those. Okay, so Jamie, we'll yeah. try some more. I know, look, like, it is a big test match at the weekend. But, mate, this is Rugby Pass Fan Zone Live Lions Edition. It doesn't get much bigger than this. Like, everyone's out, we're out the house. Who, who, who you wanted, ladies? Alan Wynne Jones! Well, I, I want Alan Wynne Jones badly, but he might not want to speak to me. I said that he didn't play well. <laughs> Have you got anyone, Jamie? Josh. Or do you want to do all of them but that one? I mean, oh. Josh Navidi, he's not playing the test. There's no excuse there, is there? Come on, Jamie! Come on, then. He's put his phone out, he's coming back. Let's try Dan. Here we go, we'll it's try, on. Uh, we'll try Biggs. We'll try Biggs. We're going to yeah, try Dan Bigger. Yeah, we'll try Dan Bigger. Oh, see, I, I, mean, I know him by uh, Biggs. There's no signal here, man. There's no signal. Hang on, we're going to try and find re reboot some signal on the way through. We can come back to that, can't we? I've got the yeah, Wi-Fi we'll password. Have oh, you got a Wi-Fi password? Get me the Wi-Fi password. We'll try later. Password. Okay, yeah. so, uh, yeah, we, we will call Dan Bigger later by we'll hook try. or crook. Absolutely. Um, LJ. As we do that, and as we try and ring, I imagine it's a Welsh man in South Africa about to do his thing. You mentioned earlier this club, well, you didn't need to mention, I know a lot of people of us know in here, this club is steeped in rugby rich history. Just tell us a little bit more. I'm here with Danny Griffiths, who's the chairman of London Welsh RFC. <laughs> we have already talked at length about the history of this club, but is it an extra special club because of the lion story that goes with it? Yeah, I think you can't remove the fact that any rugby, well, a rugby club with any kind of heritage like ours, it's going to be special. It's like a tree, isn't it? The, the better the roots, the better the branch, the right. better everything. That you just end up with a club like this. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, sorry, we look back on all of those players and they're an inspiration to us all. Just remind us of who those players have been over the years who've represented the Lions and have come from this club. Well, I mean, if you look at it, the, the big one for me is you look at the seven Lions that represented in 71, so the J.P.R. Williams, the John Dawes, you know, Mike Roberts, etc. And you think that actually started, though, back in the mid, between the war years, when you had Harry Bocott, who was another London Welshman, British Lion, who'd become Welsh selector in the 60s. He saw something in John Dawes and the way London Welsh played that no one else saw, which completely revolutionised the Welsh game in the 70s. So this whole club's played such a massive part in Welsh rugby style of play and the British Lions as well, so... You've talked about the, the tree that is London Welsh and its amazing roots. The branches perhaps have not been at their best the past few seasons. So how much appetite is there to return London Welsh back to where it once was? 
I think the thing with us is we want to return London Welsh to a point where everyone in the club can enjoy it, from the first team to the women's team to the supporters and everything. So that's all about being sustainable. That's about getting to a level where we can play the best rugby we possibly can in the current English league structure in an affordable way and not to blow it by trying to chase dreams that we can't currently afford. But we'll just keep pushing as high as we can in a sustainable way. Deal, Mr Griffiths, and good luck for the future. Lions, Lions, Wonderwall, Wonderwall. That's where we are next. See what I've done there? It's just a great segue. That's what the best do, do they not? Um, we're going to have a look at another VT. We'll get some excitement again about the tour. Again, pleasure speaking to some icons that have played in past tours. Have a look at this. The sea of red I've seen for myself um, when I went to, to, to Brisbane in the first test there. And I, I'll never forget walking in to uh, the, the stadium there and just seeing that. I mean, it was, it was dominated by red. Right, we're going to go to Chris in box four, who's in Spain. We're not jealous because it's 48 degrees here. So, Chris. Give us a wave, sir. Chris, have you got your question? Can, yeah, we can, is, are you on mute, Chris, or not? This is it, you've been waiting a while. Are you on mute? Speak up. Yeah, I was on mute, standard. <laughs> Go for it, Chris. This is it, mate. This is your time. Good to speak to you, lads. So, who is the most uh, entertaining person you've ever been on tour with to the lads that uh, are on the panel tonight? Oh, most entertaining. I'm asking the question, see. I'm not putting And why, out actually? There. And why, of course. Uh, Jamie, you're a man about... Not For town. some reason... We're right. a man about town. So on, on Lions tours, right, usually they, they pick names out of a hat with who you room with, or they'll make sure you're not rooming with someone from your country for obvious reasons. Like, that's boring, isn't it? You've got to get to know other players. 2013, I went from city to city, and for every... Room. It happened about three or four times. I was rooms with Matt Stevens, right? I don't know why. He's a bit of a party boy. I don't know whether they thought I was a sensible one. Likes guitar. Likes guitar Probably as well. Was, uh, yeah. Or I was a bit of a party boy as well and put us together. <laughs> but literally every morning I would be woken up to Matt Stevens in the shower singing. He's got an unbelievable voice. He'd be singing to himself. Uh, absolutely brilliant. So I, I'd say Matt Stevens for me. Best room I've had. Yeah, it's the energy that he he's, has a lot of energy. <laughs> Playing the guitar is what they do. Um, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I love the bloke. Um, Stevie. Um, oh, there's quite a few. There's a few characters, all right, I suppose. Um, is, is there a natural, like, you know, when you go in there and you're looking at, like, the English lads, you're thinking, like, arrogant, you're thinking Scottish lads. <laughs> oozing success. You're thinking these lads are just, like, legendary shit at rugby, but, my goodness me, they're good lads. And, like, yeah. stick to yourself, you know. Is there an element of, like you have a preconceived idea of lads before you go on tour? Oh, somebody like Andy Pyle. Like, I, I thought... I <laughs> Everybody Easy. loves Andy Pyle. Everybody loves Andy Pyle. But what a character, what a guy. And I don't, I don't think, like, he was the best rugby player. Of course, he wasn't the best rugby player on the tour. But what he brought to the tour was brilliant. Like, he brought everybody together. He could walk into a room and just smile, say one sentence, and everybody was laughing. He was just brilliant, the guy to have around the place. I roomed with him a couple of times, walked into the bathroom, and there he is, lathering himself in fake tan. But... <laughs> Was it was it was it cream? Because this is really interesting. Because the, the lad, the Welsh lads have gone away from it. You look at the lads now, like Biggs and Josh, just to name two. They're not lathered in oh, that he, kind of orangey he, green stuff. But even at the minute, I'm not sure if you've seen some pictures floating around from the 2009 tour. Like there's a picture of Andy Pyle, and he is absolutely completely orange. Like you know, he's, he's even worse than LJ at the minute. Like so, <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> Yours is a good. It's a great tone, LJ. LJ, it's a great tone. <laughs> But, Can I uh, tell you a story about Powerly and Fake Tan? Well, not Fake Tan, so I used to work at Cardiff Blues when Jamie was there and Powerly was there. And the night before my 21st birthday, I was really upset in the office that I had to work. And to cheer me up, he said, want to come for a thunbed? Oh, Leg. gosh. Leg. Who said that? Powerly. Oh, gosh. Leg. Gosh, I don't know what his vo vo vocabulary is like. Um, that was a great segue, by the way. I loved how that worked on our first show. Uh, Stevie, go on. Where were you, mate? Andy Powell legend. Andy, Andy Powell legend. Well, I, I went into the, the bathroom the next morning and he thought the bath was a toilet and I stood in the bath. 
Oh. Easy do ball. You don't, uh, you don't want to stay in the toilet seat. I don't want to say I've Correct. never had fake tan. Andrew, now we try and work out the level. We're obviously streaming live to millions of people. So me and you need to work out the level of uh, tourists that we've been on tour with, that we've enjoyed spending time with. Anyone that sticks out? See, I'm putting the, you under pressure. <laughs> I've got loads, but I'm not doing it. My, my favourite my favorite tourist and one of my favourite ever teammates would always be Harry Ellis. Uh, scrum half um, that I played with at Leicester for years. He was on the 09 Lions tour. He's the guy, and we're looking at a child on the, on the screen here, um, would do absolutely anything in terms of drinking anything that you could give to him. So you go around and you get dregs from the bar. He'd be like, I'll drink it. There's an ashtray full of cigarette butts. Pour some beer in it, he'd drink it. But he's that guy, similar to Pauli, that would try and bring up a level of entertainment and the game of, I'd never do that, but Harry Ellis would. So um, if the worst things you can think of, Harry's done it. Of course. Rupert, my producer, my edge. Shall I, do, you, do you want me to tell a quick one or not? Yeah, yeah why not? Yeah. So anyone who's followed Scotland's uh, rugby history during my 12-year tenure, the backs were absolutely shocking, by the way. Absolutely <laughs> shocking. So in 2011, we went to the World Cup, the famous World Cup where the English got up to whatever they got up to, and it was in New Zealand. They're the headline parts of it. Scotland, right? So we're playing against Romania and Georgia, the two big games. I'm vice-captain, should have been captain, but I weren't. We've scraped through the Georgia and Romania game. It's the big two. We've got Argentina and we've got England to beat to then progress to the quarterfinals for the first time probably ever. Anyway, not a big deal. I'm you talk about roommates. I'm rooming with the famous Alan Jacobson, a guy called Chunk. Everyone's heard of him. He's you know, a national treasure in Scotland. Now, he used to like going out. 2011 was the kind of... I'd argue and say it was the, the turning point from amateur to professional. That's how I saw it in 2011. So my roommate, Chunk, we just be, uh, lost to Argentina. Of co course we did. Wayne Barnes um, did us really. Contipomi was 40 metres offside. Not that I'm thinking about it now. <laughs> we had to beat England. So we've flown up to Auckland. I've repped my knee. Like Alan Wynne jones I could have carried on playing as captain, but they didn't want me to play. I was effectively dropped. So I'm in a room with Alan Jacobson, who's starting loose said. England is the biggest game on the Scottish calendar. It's the biggest game for Scotland to go to progress through to the World Cup. That's Alan shouting outside. He's absolutely loving it. <laughs> so I'm in a room with Alan Jacobson in Auckland. It's a short turnaround. It's a six-day turnaround. And we're like, right, this is it. Chunk, we need you. Nicknamed Chunk, he had no teeth. We need you. Gone. Nowhere to be seen. Wednesday, OK, as Vice Captain James Robson's ringing me, he's like, mate, where's Chunk? He's your roommate. I'm looking in the bed. He's nowhere to be seen. <laughs> nowhere to be seen. Need to go and find him. So I've found him in one of the other lads' room, unresponsive. Said to James Robson, mate, I found him in room 101. He's unresponsive. I can't get him. I've tripped water on him. James runs up to the room with a defib on his back. We're giving him kind of rubbing his chest and stuff like that. Nothing. Managed to wake him up anyway. We get down to team run. I'll speed through the story. This kid's on here. We're running. We're doing plays off nine. The ball is coming straight off Chunk's forehead. He he, as in his words, I can he see, pal. I can he see. <laughs> The game is on Saturday evening, enough time for Chunk to recover. So he does a Thursday night, ready for Friday, recovered, ready for Saturday. I have never, go through the archives on YouTube. My performance against Romania in 2006 was headline. His performance in 2011 against England was one of the best performances I've seen from a Scotland forward. And he lost his teeth in the game. And after the game, anyway, go through the archives. Scotland lost that game, of course we did. Tapping Chunk on the back, I'm like, mate, that was unbelievable that is like one of the best games he's like what's happened what's happened mate <laughs> couldn't remember the game i says mate we're out we're out he's like jim i know we're out i know we're out but what happened in the game i said no 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 mate we're out of the world cup we're out of the world cup anyway flew back um and got back to the hotel and they speeded everyone out of the hotel you get on a flight home emirates first class no doubt don't know how we've only beaten romania and georgia i get home i'm home for 14 days mrs jacobson rings mrs hamilton has anyone seen chunk <laughs> No word of a lie. <laughs> Alan's second wedding two years ago was pretty epic as well, I'll be honest. So, <laughs> Mrs. Jacobson, um, if you're watching, it wasn't my fault. It was, well, let's blame Wayne Barnes, let's blame an Englishman. Um, we are linking to the Springboks now and how to beat them. Jamie, give us a couple of lines on how this team beat the Springboks. Uh, it's, they bring line speed. When you, when you come off the line that hard, you are vulnerable in a wider channels. So either they risk getting a ball there, it's high risk, high reward. Uh, offloading, if they can get, we talked about, you know, we want to see Robbie Henshaw, subtle tips at the line, 
get and be on the advantage line and the kicking game. You know, Biggs is one of the best crossfield kickers. Dinks. Their defence is really, really solid. So they're, they're going to have to try and expose them some way or other. But, yeah, for, for me, it's playing to width, kicking game, and trying to get in behind defensive line with offloads. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to look at another VT now with some of the guys who've been there and done it and see how inspired we feel after that. Roll. How good is it to call yourself a British and Irish Lion? It seems to me like the pinnacle of any player's career. To me, it, it means everything about rugby. Um, I, I, a big thing for me is you have to be selfless. You have to give every single part of you, every secret, every bit of knowledge you have about rugby, you have to give it on that Lions tour. I think being a, a British and Irish Lion was the highest honour that I ever achieved as a rugby player. It, it, it probably gave me, in fact, it definitely gave me some of the best rugby memories that, that, that I've got. So where were you when you found out you were selected and how were you told? I seem to remember it, it was uh, uh, announced on... Um, you can say it. You can say teletext if you want. I it mean, might. It might have been teletext. It might have been CFAX or teletext or on the radio. I, I I couldn't remember, but it happens that my wife was in the car with me. I, I think I did hear it on the radio because it, it's a long list and it ends with the back row. And if you your name begins with W, I was possibly the last person announced. So I was probably lost hope by the time we uh, uh we, we got halfway through the back row, but. I think that's how it happened. Uh, my wife says it is, that's the way it happened. <laughs> my wife said I couldn't go. She said I couldn't go, it'd be selfish. I had a, had a rugby league contract to pursue, and the contract that we signed was, was pre pretty ordinary, but there's some things, you know, I don't like talking about money, because, but it was a significant, because I was a full-time rugby player. And she said, you, you've got four months at Halifax, you need to honour that. You can't go on this bloody swan song tour. What if you get injured in the first? What if you break your leg? You know, you've a young family, and I, I sat on it for two days and just turned to her and said, look, there's some things in life that are far greater than money. I have to go on this trip. And she said, fine, we'll support you. Yeah. I get the feeling that these quiz questions we set might have been quite difficult because there's a pile of abandoned papers on the bar here. I'm going to go through the answers, shout them out one by one if you know them. So the first question that we asked you was who ran the length of the field to punch a springbok when Willie John McBride called 99 on the 1974 tour? And it was, of course, JPR. So at least everyone should have one out of ten. Number two, name the starting Lions backline in the third test in Joburg in 2009. Fez, I hope you got this right because you were out there, as was Jamie. Uh, Phillips, Jones, Williams, Flutie, Bo, Monier, Carney. Not easy, that LJ. Question three. Not easy one. We've name got one all the second two rowers two. who have captained the Lions in South Africa since 1974. Alan Wynne Jones, Jones, yeah. Any more? Oh, no. McBride, Johnson, O'Connell, one missing, Beaumont. So we've got them all in the room here, but did anyone get them all? Number four, what Springbok player did Matt Dawson dummy to score in the first test in 1997? Jamie? Gary Teichman. Correct. Yes. My question was, what Springbok did Ronan O'Gara take out in the air in the second test in 2009, which led to the winning penalty? Jim? Who yeah, the, the guys are calling it Mornay Stain. Dupree. 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 There you go. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Question got to stay six humble. was who holds the record for the most Lions caps and who might equal him in this series? <laughs> Willie John. Willie John's 17 and Alan... Sorry, Alan Wynn won't equal him, I'm being told. He'll get 12, which is equal to... Does anyone know who, al who else is on 12 lines? Mike, Mike Gibson. No. Centre. Graham Price. I heard it down here. Fantastic. Oh. Absolute skill. Yeah, so... Not, not a household name, but an absolute legend, I'm being told. Question but he seven. Is. 
Question seven, on tour, on which tour did the Lions become known as the British and Irish Lions? 1950 to New Zealand it was. I haven't heard it in the room. Question eight, who was the last uncapped player to be taken on a Lions tour? Will Greenwood. Will Greenwood. Right here next to me. Question nine, no fighting boys, no fighting. Name all the London Welsh players on the 1974 Lions Tour to South Africa. They've been mentioned twice already in the room, so I would hope that you got JPR Williams, Clive Rees. No points for Merv the Swerve Davis. He was back at Swansea then. Question 10, how many points did Dan Carter score against the Lions in the second test in 2005? 35. I can hear it in the room. It's 33, he scored 33 out of the 43 points. Right, okay, so if you got four or more, put your hand in the air. Jim. <laughs> if, yeah, if, if you're dishonest about this, you will be getting a round in. If you got five or more, keep your hand in the air. If you got six or more. That's it. Oh, there's someone at the bar. Oh, gee, I've got my hand. I know what's in that whiskey, and it's good whiskey. Jamie, so I'm keeping my hands up. Jim, you, ha Jim, you had the answers. It, yeah, very it true. I've still like got it wrong. I'm sorry. Jim, there's someone behind you with their hand up. Is it just the one? Can you turn to your left and tell me? if Seven or more? Really? Is this, so it's... So who had the, their hand up at the bar here? There were seven in the back line. <laughs> Phillips, Jones, Williams, Flutey, Bow, Monier, Carney. So he how looks many confident. Did you get right, you had your hand up. How many did you get? Who had their hand up at the bar? This is Bad Bants. Who had their hand up? LJ, they're all feeling vulnerable now. They're all feeling vulnerable. We can work out the winner after, can't we, LJ? You had five. So has anyone here got more than five right? I don't know, maybe. Maybe. This is carnage. I went to good school, but I've got, I'm thick as anything. So. Right. <laughs> no. It's okay. Stevie's not got any hair now either. The back there's, there's answers on the back. Right. I've been told just to give the award away. Unbelievable scenes. Unbelievable scenes. I'm going to give the award away. Um, I am actually going to give it to the man in the red polo shirt. Oh. I like, I like the cut of his. What a gym. guy! What a guy! Yes, sir. The famous grouse. The famous grouse. Go on, Di. Never seen Di to a pint. Congratulations. Yeah, go on, Di. Uh, yeah, I thought so. Nice, Di. Lovely. We should say to everyone watching at home, drink responsibly. If you're over 70, don't worry about it. Di, well done. As we look now to our final Spirit of Rugby Wonderwall, let's take a look back, Jamie, at one of the legends. Well, he is a legend. The great and powerful Simon Shaw. Let's see what he had to say. When you're walking in amongst it as a supporter and you just look around and you, all you can see are red shirts, it's mind-blowing. I was more pumped than I've ever been watching a game watching that first test match in Australia. Hello, we're back. How are we all? Can you all hear us on the Wonderwall? This is the final one. Amu, we're going to come to you in South Africa. Yes, thumbs up, sir. I'm loving that British and Irish Lions shirt that you're wearing. We're going to put your audio on now. Can you hear us okay? <laughs> Yeah, he has. He's got the spring watch. Um, you, you got us. This is your moment. What question? Uh, you need to unmute yourself, sir. Unmute yourself. No. Not yet. Hey, let me lip read you. What have you got? Let me lip read you. What, what is the best back row? to pick for this test. Oh my God, I'm so good. Um, <laughs> Amu, I've absolutely smashed it. Stevie, let's come on to you. Okay, a lot of talking points around the British and Irish Lions back row before we give our predictions and head-to-heads. Who would you have picked? Laws, Curry, 
And Jack Conan, six, seven, and eight. Is that right? Yes or no? In your opinion? Um, I think Hamish Watson is, can feel hard done by. He's been brilliant on this tour. He, he he does punch above his weight. He's very explosive, very powerful. But Curry in the last game was was superb. So. I think that was a flip of a coin, 50-50 decision. I don't, I don't think it really matters because both players are playing exceptionally well. When it comes to six, Courtney Laws, he's a, just a bit of a plotter in my opinion. He's a really good line-out option. He's a good second row, but is he versatile enough to play at six? We'll soon find out. I hope he proves me wrong, but I just don't think he can mix it with the likes of Peter Steff to toy um, in the South African back row and Khaleesi if he brings his A game. So for me, um, I would have played Tag Burn at six. Um, I just think he's got a bit more about him in attack. And if Warren Gatlin's looking to play that more expansive game plan, then Tagburn would certainly be better suited towards that. Well, if Courtney Laws is a plodder, I don't know what the hell I was, if we was <laughs> calling that. Um, Goody, Hamish Watson, that man on the screen, obviously friend of mine, friend of ours. Um, we can debate it all day long. You know, Navidi's obviously a quality player as well. Uh, Toulouse, Tipperick. Hamish Watson... Do you rate him as highly as a Scots, even though he's got an English accent, but he's got a Scottish name? Well, he's English, isn't he? So, um, you know, his background is Scottish, but he's born and bred in England and he's moved back up there. So, yeah, listen, he is... Um He's player of the Six Nations, wasn't he? So, you know, you don't get that accolade by being average. He, you know, both sides of the ball. We started the first uh, game on tour and he was he was brilliant, ball in hand. He's, he's physical. Some people have said he's too small. He's absolutely not because he smashes people in defence. His ball carrying is phenomenal. But in reality, Curry and Hamish Watson are both very similar players. The risk would have been to perhaps play them both, but you do then need uh, the physicality and perhaps a line-out option of a tall six, a.k.a. Courtney Laws, who... Stevie Ferris, unfortunately, doesn't rate. So, listen, Hamish Watson will get on. He'll have a massive impact on the game. Hopefully, we're going to see him start either the second or the third test as well. And, um, you know, the battle between him and Curry has been phenomenal. And he, he's unlucky not to start, but Curry's great. I read some stat, like, I don't have it on me at the minute, but I read some stat, like, Hamish Watson hasn't missed a tackle uh, last 260 tackles, something like that, since way before yeah, the no Six biggie. Nations That's kicked right. off. Yeah, yeah. Like, He's unbelievable, but I think he'd be a better player to bring off the bench, in my opinion, because he does go sideways a bit across the pitch when he does have ball in hand. That up and in defence, the physicality that the South Africans are going to bring, they could suffocate that a little bit. There could be a few more turnovers, packing down on the, on the rock a bit more, trying to blow the counter rock. So for me, I think he's a better guy to have on the bench. And Tom Curry's just a little bit more solid. And by the way, I absolutely do rate Courtney Laws, but I rate him as a second row, not a back row. Oh, there we go. We've got that on file. He's watching this. Courtney, Courtney, we I'm love so, you. I'm sorry, Courtney. Okay, Courtney, I'm sorry as well. I was a plotter. We're going to go to the finally. We're going to go to our wonder wall. We've got Josh Razy. How are you, mate? I'm hearing rumours that you're Harlequins S&C coach. You write for Rugby Pass. Anyway, you might do all of them, but can you hear us? Can we hear you? Say hello so we can hear you. Hello. Yes! Yeah. We have a winner. Don't answer the question that I've asked you. Just ask us a question and then we can formulate an answer. Okay, my question is, who is the best Lions captain ever? Oh, the best Lions captain ever. Jamie, I'm going to come to you. If Alan Wynne-Jones wins this tour, will he go down as the best? Martin Johnson, 97, because it broke that amateur professional era. I'm not giving you any more. You just tell me. Yeah. Willie John McBride, I'll of course. I'm my head and my head at you. Um, yeah, if Alan Wynne-Jones skippers the Lions for victory this series, he's got to be in the conversation. It's hard to look past someone like Willie John McBride, isn't it, uh, you know, through history, uh, who captained multiple tours and won multiple tours. So... Yeah, I think if you've captained multiple winning tours, it's hard to disagree with Willie John McBride. Yeah, absolutely. Jono, it's got to be, hasn't it, for me? Leicester bloke. But actually, you look at that Lions tour in 97, that's one of the most iconic tours in the modern era. Uh, you know, the skipper there, it, it was brilliant to see. And it, it raised his profile as well. And then, of course, he wins the World Cup a few years later. Right, well, I'm going to thank the Wonderwall participants, some in Spain, some driving their car. <laughs> Some in South Africa, Josh, St Stevie's family member. It's a bloody good job on my lip reader as well, but we will make sure, okay, that we can get all that embedded in. So a big thank you to the famous Grouse for putting that together. Solange Yvar, cheers. I don't know what I'll, I'll just say. Yeah, Yaki Bar, that's the one. Yeah, of course, to our Wonder Wallers, of course, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Right. So we get to the back end of the show. We're going to look at predictions, but we're also going to look at head to heads um, when we look at this tour. I th so when we look at the big head to heads, you can hear that I'm hearing back and forth, can't you? What's going on? So when you, th when you look at the head to heads, 
Stevie, we're going to come to you first. Who have you picked for your head-to-heads when you look at it? There's obviously loads, and people can talk about them. They can pick the matchups. Who have you gone for? Yeah, well, I went for, obviously, Courtney Laws versus... Oh, what are you on about? Mate, you can't bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's in the wrong position. Mate, mate, we've, mate, we've already covered this. Like, <laughs> we've already covered this. But I think the back row battle is going to be the winning of the game for me because they are involved so much in the game. Um, and I feel if, if, if the Lions could get some front football, that they can win this. They, they absolutely can win this. I think there was a bump on the road against South Africa A eh? with the bookies. So the, the Lions are favourites. And I certainly feel that... This man here knows Warren Gatland a lot better than I do. He will have a plan. He will have something in place to beat this South African team. And they're match fit. And if uh, Courtney Laws can prove me wrong and perform really well in the back row, I, I think they can do it, Jim. Absolutely. Andrew, we're going to come to you next for your head-to-head. -head. Yeah, my head-to-head -head is Faf de Klerk coming up against Ali Price. Uh, Ali Price, for some, was a bit of a surprise to be picked ahead of Conor Murray. Uh, but on form, he's electric. Uh, he's a lot of front football, and he can really bring some pace and energy to this attacking team for the Lions. Faf de Klerk, he's their talisman, isn't he? The blonde hair flowing, he goes and flies into tackles. He is 110% in everything that he does. Um, he's the fulcrum of their team in terms of the pace they play at. His ability to get the ball out the breakdown and his kicking game is going to be huge. So if Ali Price can match and keep Faf de Klerk quiet, I think that uh, the Lions can certainly win the game. We should apologise to Faf de Klerk as well. We're thinking that he's going to win the series. He's going to get a load more Botox and <laughs> his nose might grow back off the back of that. So Faf de Klerk, we know you're watching, live streaming in South Africa. I know you love the show. So big hello to you. Jamie? Uh, I've gone for the wingers, uh, Duhan van der Merwe up against Cheslin Colby. Um, if there's ever a lesson in here that the rugby is a game for all shapes and sizes, it's the matchup between these two. Cheslin Colby, a bit of reminiscent of Shane Williams, but with three or four times the power. Outrageous player. But, you know, if there's ever one player you don't want to come up against in a one-on-one -on -one situation, it's this guy. He made a lot of top, top players look very stupid. Myself included, actually, played for Bath a few years ago and literally tackled thin air in a Heineken Cup game. Uh, delighted when Duan van der Merwe got named in the squad. Immense in the Six Nations. When George North got injured, I think this is the go-to ball carrier in the Lions' back line. Uh, forget, on, I think, yeah, no, I'm going, to, I'm going to cut you off just there because I think a lot of people in this room or people watching would recognise the Scottish name in the surname part of that. Yep. But having been... No, look, but we joke about it, but having been a British and Irish Lion and obviously everything around that, are you bothered that he's South African? Let's not. He's going home, he's home. Like, there's all the talk in the media about it's weird seeing him be a British and Irish lion, having played South Africa under 20s with these two. Is it weird or you not bother? You just want to win? Them's the rules. The guy's qualified for Scotland for residency, so, you know, fair play to him. I, I think his ability to carry the ball in traffic, it's, he's going to be huge, you know. I think he's the best ball carrier the Lions have behind the, the scrum, and at times on the weekend, we're going to go to have, to have to go route one, and he's going to be the main man. Conversely, Colby, Jesus, I mean, the more touches this guy gets, watch out Lions, because he's outrageous. Yeah, my goodness me. LJ, before we come to you, I'm just going to talk about my head-to-heads, which I've gone for Maru Otoji, who I mentored through uh, to where we see him now. <laughs> Basically, if I wasn't so crap, he would not have been fast-tracked through, and it might have been a couple of years later, so you're welcome. Eben Etzebeth, who genuinely looks like this, he's got one arm bigger than the other, but either way, they're both bigger than <laughs> my legs. Um, but look, two, you know, the modern day enforcers, the physicality, the way that they affect the game. You know, there's a lot of talk about Maratoji in terms of is he as good as people make out? You know, the physicality, the penalties that he gives away. But you look about around his work, Stephen, we've spoken about. You look around his work in the tight. Adam Beard's obviously done very well around the line out drive, line out more. Maratoji does that. Ebenet Sabeth, the physicality that he brings. These are two are the kind of front runners when it comes to physicality, which the Lions will need. So I'm looking forward to seeing that matchup. More importantly, LJ, you've got a nice matchup that you think is going to lead us into the predictions. Well, yeah, I guess the captains is where it's at. You've got philanthropist, Rugby World Cup winner, friend of Jay Z on one side in Khaleesi. And then on the other side, you've got the unbreakable, undamageable, comes back from everything, Lazarus, Alan Wynne Jones. So, from your perspective, boys, I want to know who you'd rather be led by. Andrew. Who would you rather be led by and then lead that into your predictions? Well, so which one of them men would you follow? Maybe not that you might struggle. I don't want to stare at it. You might struggle to play a game at the weekend. But pretend you would and you're in your, I was going to say, your prime. I'd follow Alan Wynne jones into battle for two reasons. One, uh, you see what he's done on the rugby field, uh, leading Wales and, and obviously previously uh, the Lions on the last tour for a couple of the games. Um, yeah, he, he is someone that demands respect. And, is the forefront of everything that's good about 
leading the challenge for Wales and, and, and leads from the front in that respect. Um, his, his recovery from injury is phenomenal. You, know, you speak to any player that's been involved with him, the, the professionalism, and he's a man that when he speaks, people listen, and I think that's really key. A lot of players blow out hot air like yourself, Jim, and it, it misses the point. The other thing with Adam and Jones, you follow him into battle, then I can help him out on the hair front afterwards because he definitely needs a hair transplant, which well, I, don't I think can it, certainly I, help with. I'll be honest, I don't think it's just Alan Wynne Jones that needs Stevie. Um, <laughs> all of us here. Stevie, out of these two, and then into your predictions, who would you follow? I know you follow either man, um, but who do you think is going to win the, this series? Yeah, for me, Alan Wynne Jones is just the ultimate competitor. I've written him off a few times in the past and you write him off at your peril. He always bounces back the 2017 um, in New Zealand. He was just unbelievable, wasn't he, when he came back into the team. And I would follow him, not a problem. I know him a little bit just from the 2009 tour. So yeah, of course, Alaman Jones. However, I think he's gonna be on the losing side this weekend. I can't, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna go with my heart. I'm not gonna go with my heart on, on, on this occasion. I'm gonna go with my head. I just think, with the power, the huge men that South Africa have on the bench, they will close the game out. I think there's going to be a hell of a lot of kicking. Um, and yeah, the bigger, stronger team for me is just going to edge it. I think it's going to be extremely tight, but unfortunately, I'm going to go with South Africa and hopefully the Lions can turn it around the following week. Oh, Jamie, where are you going? Oh. Uh, Alan Win I've played under Alan Winner as a skipper for, for you know for Wales many times and, and obviously for the Lions in Australia. Wonderful player, wonderful bloke. Um, I've also played under Sia Khaleesi with the Stormers. I, I played at the Stormers last year along you know with our back row. We played with five or six Springboks in that side. Khaleesi and Steph Dutoy were in our back row. Frightening team to be a part of when those two are in. You know, Peter Steph Dutoy, we haven't talked much about him. Like, he, he almost lost his leg last year, Peter Steph Dutoy. Special player, world player of the year in a World Cup year. Um, you know, we've spoken a lot about Khaleesi, but I think their talisman in the back row is Peter Steph Dutoy. I played in the game where he, he got a real nasty dead leg. Tough, tough man. Like, the guy never shows pain or emotion. He's just steely eyed and he was sat in the change room I think he got two dead legs in the same spot and he was shaking in pain like he rushed to hospital I think he was out of the game for about six to nine months got compartment syndrome almost lost his leg to save his life um, so for him to come back we've spoken about Alan Wynne Jones coming back three weeks into a dislocated shoulder for him to come back and play rugby again is an immense story and alongside this guy they're just talismanic aren't they for the spring box I just don't think, I think all the factors lean towards the Lions' result. Pre the preparation, that South Africa A game is huge. In 2009, we played a lot of warm-up games. We weren't ready for what was coming in that first test in Durban. First half, they blew us off the park. We weren't prepared. Gatland wouldn't want to see history repeat itself. He was forwards coach on that tour 12 years ago, and he would have been delighted playing South Africa A in that warm-up game. I think it'll stand him in very good stead. And I, I just think that the, the preparation the Lions have had, the disruption to the box camp, as much as it'll galvanise them, I don't think it'll be enough. It's at sea level. I see the Lions winning the first test. I'll get, yeah, yeah. I'll give a couple of lines. I, I was in uh, South Africa with Rugby Pass, did an Explorers uh, show, went to see a Khaleesi's home where he's come, come from saw where Ches and Colby, and what rugby does in South Africa as a nation is quite unbelievable. We talk about the power of sport in this country. We've obviously seen it during the pandemic when we've been able to watch it at home. In a country that's on its absolute knees now, to watch South Africa play, you know, for Sia Khaleesi to be in bed with COVID or whatever he has been for the last 20 days and for him to start, they know the magnitude of these test series. They, they know the magnitude of this game. And I, I, I don't want to write them off. I think the Lions will win this week. I think South Africa will come back into Test 2. And I hope that the Lions can win the third Test match and win the series. But it's South Africa. They're world champions again. They're world champions after 95, going into the 97, 2009, as well off the back of the 2007 Lions tour. So we are now out of time. I just want to give a few thank yous just before we end the show. So obviously, a big thank you to London Welsh Rugby Club. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> It's obviously great to be back out of the house and see people uh, in person. Also to First Five Media, who've put all of this on this evening. They're all behind there. They're in my ear as well. The, the famous grouse as well. The spirit of rugby, the official whiskey partner as well, who've helped put this on. Also, the guys here on stage, three 
rugby legends and goodies here as well, so. <laughs> Goody. Obviously, everyone in here, the fans, the fans watching at home, rugby pass from us, a big thank you, LJ. And we're going to be sang out this evening, aren't we? I'm sure. <laughs> Thanks very much. And we'll be at Harpenden Rugby Club next Thursday, 7 o'clock. So if you can't be there, be square, get it? But exactly, Harpenden. But we're going to be live on rugby pass as well. So if you can't be there, follow us live on YouTube or Facebook. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> type of challenges as a player that you want to be a part of. The, the words came out of my mouth post-match. I just wanted to be a part of it and win. There was this energy and, and they sang, they screamed, they shouted. The noise levels were un unbelievable. I get so emotional about it, that's the thing it does. <clears throat> you get the four countries like nothing else in the world that come together and be won. It's not the selection of being not selected, it's more you just want to know. Johnny Hill! Oh, no. oh my wow. god! Just instinctively, I've just I've just dropped it. I've just gone for the drop goal. Lions brings out different things in players when you get into that environment. And it does challenge you and it changes you. Best experience, rugby experience of my life, bar none, was the um, was the 1997 Lions Tour to South Africa. 